Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Pasadena, California by Dr. Mark Raymond. So he is a physicist and engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of the most storied and amazing research facilities in the entire world, as I said, pushing the boundaries of space exploration. So he said before we got all started here that he's wanted to do this since he was, you know, four years old, and that will shine through in the whole presentation. We're going to dive in with his, his amazing passion for what he does and how much he loves his job in a second. But as an engineer, he gets to work on a huge variety of projects. He's currently the chief engineer and mission director for Dawn, which is orbiting a dwarf planet at the edge of our solar system. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that and about Mark's work generally. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Raymond, and take it away. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're perfect. Well, thank you very much. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. As you just heard from Jesse, I'm doing what I've wanted to do my whole life. I got interested in space when I was four years old. And when I was in the fourth grade, I decided I wanted to get a doctorate in physics, which is a kind of sci advanced degree in science. And I wanted to work for NASA. It was a few more years till I did, but I'm doing what I've wanted to do my whole life. And every day, I just think this is so cool. I feel so lucky. I feel like I feel like a big kid. I'm just getting to have great fun. And so I want to show you some of the things I've been working on recently and hope you think it's interesting too. So I'm going to share my screen here and Jesse will confirm for me that uh, in a second that wants to work. Everything look okay? No, so I still have just you up right now. Okay, well, I clicked the share screen. Hmm. Um, it worked in practice. <laughs> it actually says screen sharing has failed to start. Please try again later. Oh, well, why don't you dive through with a little bit about what you get to do, and then we'll try in a few minutes and see if we can get the images up then. Okay, so I've been working on this mission that, as Jesse told you, is called Dawn. And one of the things that I think is so cool about it is we've gotten to explore alien worlds. It, the spacecraft went to the main asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. You know, I think many people think of asteroids as like chunks of rock, maybe the size of a building or the size of a mountain, right? That's how they're often depicted in movies. But these places are really big. And to me, they're not just chunks of rock, they're whole alien worlds. And I mean, what could be cooler than sending a spacecraft to a distant world that we could only view faintly through a telescope? And that's what I think is so neat about what I've gotten to do. And so let me try again here to share my screen. You're perfect. It worked. Okay, good. So you can see my opening yeah. slide there? Yeah. Okay. So the main spacecraft here across the center is called Dawn. And you see Ceres over here. Can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. OK, so Ceres is where the spacecraft is right now. But we first visited another alien world called Vesta. And just for fun, because I love this so much, I put in another spacecraft that I worked on with the cool name Deep Space One, which got the United States' first close-up pictures of the nucleus of a comet. But let me go on with a little bit more about Dawn. And so here's just a picture of the night sky. And you know, when you look up at the night sky, you see lots of stars, and maybe you know that some of them are planets or something else, but you really can't see much. And if you just look at one faint dot in the center, you can't really tell anything about it. But when we use the powerful Hubble Space Telescope, we can zoom in and see it's not just a point of light, it's kind of a fuzzy little blob. And when we send the Dawn spacecraft there, we can turn it into a true alien world. And to me, that is just so cool to send a spacecraft to a distant point of light in the night sky and then see all this incredible detail. And since Jesse mentioned snow at the beginning, I'll, I'll mention that we nicknamed this the snowman, a group of three craters. And of course, we saw a lot of other things on this alien world. And I'm just gonna show you a movie of what it would look like if you were lucky enough to be there. And so you see there are of course a lot of craters all over the place, but also I wanna draw your attention here as we come down to near the equator, you can see what turn out 
to be a lot of canyons. And in fact, many of these are larger than the Grand Canyon in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me, there are more than 90 of these. And they're left over from an impact with another asteroid that occurred a billion years ago. And when that impact happened, that is an, a big object hit Vesta near the South Pole, it made a big crater here, 300 miles, 500 kilometers in diameter. And we're now seeing this crater, this is part of the crater wall right here, with a mountain in the center. This mountain is 110 miles across and rises to two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. So the planet you live on doesn't have anything that can compare with this. And that, again, is part of what I think is so cool about this. We got to go to this alien world and discover this huge crater with a mountain more than twice the height of Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on Earth. What could be cooler than that? Well, I'll show you something that I think actually is cooler than that. And that is where the spacecraft is right now at a dwarf planet called Ceres. And here it is in views from the Dawn spacecraft. And again, you can see it has a lot of craters. It also has a lot of other strange features, especially including these bright places like this. And here's a close up view of that crater. Now this crater is more than 50 miles across. Think of that. So the whole city that you live in and all the surrounding areas would just fit maybe in this bright area at the center. When we got these pictures, we wondered, what could this bright area be? And of course, we wanted to get closer and get even better views. And sure enough, we did. And it, it kind of looks like snow. But what we now know is that Ceres, this alien world, has underground salt water. And sometimes that water makes its way to the surface, like through these canyons here that you can see big cracks in the ground, the water makes its way to the ground, <coughs> excuse me, I mean, makes its way to the surface, and then essentially evaporates. For the older students, we could say it sublimates, but you could say it evaporates and leaves behind the salt that was dissolved in it. So what you're seeing here are giant salt flats, many, many miles across. And so they reflect more light than the normal ground does. And now here we're taking a look at the same crater from the side. And I want to zoom in a little bit because we got our spacecraft a lot closer. And now I want to show you some, I think, cool close-up pictures. So the first is going to be over here on the crater wall. And just look at this crater wall with these big rocks sticking out of it. I just think that's really cool to be able to get close enough to this crater to see that. And we can look at this strange, again, these salt deposits here, and look at this weird, uh, weird landscape. I mean, this looks like a huge square, and this is, this is uh, about a mile around. It's a huge place, but you see that it's cut across by this deep canyon, and you can sort of see here it's shaped like a V, and we think this is how the water got up to the ground, flowed across the surface, evaporated and then left behind these salts. We can get in still closer and now I'm gonna flip you around to the other side and take a look at this mountain here. And here again, this strange, strange scenery. And you can see this stuff looks like it flowed down here through cracks because it was at one time possibly in water. And we can take another look here. It's still another area. And it's just, I think it's really amazing to look at how sharp the, the border is between the bright area and the dark area. It's just, it's a very strange uh, alien sight, unlike anything you would see on Earth. And then we can fly up still higher and take another look and just remind ourselves of how weird this place is with these craters that look like lots of things you've seen on, in pictures of other planets, but with these brilliantly glowing 
you know, features here that almost look like they're emitting light, although of course they're not, they're just reflecting it. And I wanna show you another picture here. Again, lots of craters and things, but look on the horizon, there's a mountain here. And this is the tallest mountain uh, on Ceres. It stands about as tall as most of the tallest mountains in, uh, in the continental United States and in Canada. And it turns out to be a volcano, an extinct volcano. And you can see another view of it here. It just juts up from the landscape. Now on Earth, volcanoes are made from magma and lava. I'm sure you've heard of lava. On Earth, it's very hot, right? But Ceres, it's farther from the sun. It's much colder there. And so instead of the lava being hot, like we think of here on Earth, it's actually cold. It's made of water and mud and rock and ice. And in fact, um, it, it has a lot of the same properties on Ceres that lava does here on Earth but everything is much colder. And so I just think that's a, that's a really cool view. And I wanna show you one more picture from Ceres that I really like. This is the wall of a crater, and then here's the floor of the crater. And if you look, you can see the trail of maybe a rock that tumbled down the crater wall. And if you look closely, you can actually see the rock at the bottom. And you can see that in other places as well. Here's another place where a rock bounced and tumbled down the crater wall, and there's the rock at the bottom. And in fact, there are a lot of rocks here we can see on trails. Here's one that crossed the other trails. So we got so close to this alien world that we could see individual rocks on the ground. And I also think it's neat because up here you can see some on the crater wall that have slid part way down, but haven't yet fallen the rest of the way, although surely they will at some point. Now, this, our, our ability to send a spacecraft to this alien world, or in fact, these two alien worlds, Vesta and Ceres, and to go into orbit around them and study them, turns out a mission like that would be not just difficult, but impossible, impossible if we didn't use ion propulsion which I first heard of in Star Wars. And maybe you recognize here the Star Wars TIE fighter, T-I-E. Well, in Star Wars, the TIE fighter stands for twin ion engine, because this was the most futuristic, coolest, advanced technology they could think of. And to me, one of the fun things, one of the many fun things about getting to work for NASA is I get to turn that science fiction into science fact. And so here's an artist's concept of Dawn using its ion engine, the real thing, as it flew into orbit around dwarf planet Ceres not too long ago. And I think this is so cool to be able to get to use something I heard of in science fiction, but to turn it into the real thing, not just for a movie, but for a real space flight. And here's an ion engine operating here at, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where I work. And you can see it really does produce this cool blue glow like in science fiction movies. And the reason for that is not because we got the idea from science fiction, but rather because they got the idea from the real thing, which is what we do. And here's an artist's concept of the spacecraft with one of its three ion engines. We actually have three. and here it is firing up the ion engine. And this is very much what the spacecraft looked like as it traveled through the solar system from Earth past Mars. We went far beyond Mars, <coughs> excuse me, to Vesta and then on to Ceres. And that's what the spacecraft looks like. And here's the real spacecraft. Uh, when it was being built, you know, we wear these what we call bunny suits that is uh, these white protective outfits to keep any little particles of dust or hair or skin from getting into the spacecraft. And this is the actual spacecraft. Here are these big solar wings are folded up because you can't fit a big spacecraft inside the little nose cone of a rocket. So we fold it up 
This is the main antenna. This is one of the ion engines. And this is my friend, Tom. And when we get the spacecraft in space, these solar wings open up. And I'll show you an artist's concept of that with, uh, in just a moment. But here's what it looks like when these solar array wings are opened up. This is really a huge spacecraft. In fact, from one wing tip to the other is 65 feet or 20 meters. That's the distance from a pitcher's mound to home plate in a professional baseball field. This is a big spacecraft. And this, when we launched it, we did it from Florida as we do most of the launches from Cape Canaveral. And we had a really beautiful launch and got the spacecraft up into space. And then this is a different spacecraft that I worked on, but one that's very similar. And so you can see it extends those solar arrays and then points them at the sun. And then the sunlight produces electrical power to operate all of the systems. And here you can see it leaving the earth and the moon behind as it fires up its ion engine. And with the, sun, with the electricity from the solar power, solar panels, we can run the ion engine, the radio, the computer, the cameras and everything else in order to make this spacecraft do what we want. And now just to finish off, this is the orbit that the spacecraft is in right now. There it is circling or not circling, but flying around Ceres. And once every 27 hours, that's about once a day, it goes down to a really low altitude like that. And that's what allowed us to get those close up pictures. And the spacecraft actually recently just completed its mission but it's gonna stay in this orbit for many, many decades, probably even for centuries. So when you grow up and have children and they grow up and have children and they grow up and have children and even they grow up and have children for, for probably hundreds of years into the future, the Dawn spacecraft will be orbiting dwarf planet Ceres and you got to hear about it today.